blessings of God's grace, his mercy and peace be yours in abundance as you continue to celebrate that cornerstone, that foundation of your life, Christ Jesus who died for you. This morning, uh, we want to focus on the last verse of the, the gospel lesson that we heard just a couple minutes ago. We'll come back to that verse in just a couple of minutes. Uh, let us begin with a prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, bless our time together today as we gather in your house to worship you for your love, your mercy, your grace. Bless us and equip us for lives of service that we might continue to find many opportunities to continue to do great things for you that glorify you, things that we can do uh, to share your love with others. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. I suppose since it's Mother's Day, we ought to take some time and think about the moms, maybe, that we would nominate as Mother of the Year. And you can do multiple moms. Uh, maybe it's your own mother that you think of, or maybe those women in your life have sort of served as a, as a mother to you. Um, and, and since we only have a couple of minutes here this morning, I'm only going to give you three reasons why you would choose the person that you did for Mother of the World. So just think through your mind. Maybe not too, it doesn't take too long to do that, I suppose. Um, but just a couple reasons, right? Um, when we do that on a Mother's Day, uh, even this last week, right, we've seen things all over Facebook and advertisements and so forth of why we would celebrate Mother's Day. There's some pretty ama amazing reasons why we would spend an entire day uh, to focus on uh, the maternal instincts, right, that motherly love uh, of, of women in our lives uh, through which God has blessed us. And when you think of all of creation and how God designed everything, we marvel at that, that design of motherhood, right? how God weaves together a mother's heart and a mother's strength and willingness to care for her children. And so today we express that appreciation, maybe for all those virtues that mom tried to instill in us over the years, uh, those demonstrations of selfless, self-sacrificing love. Um, maybe you're, you uh, did the Facebook post, uh, maybe a card in the mail. Uh, I have to make sure I call my mom today. I, we didn't get any card in the mail. Uh, my family's terrible about that. If we, if we call on a day, then we're doing pretty good. Um, but my mom will be here next weekend, so I'll, you make sure I wish her a happy Mother's Day in church next Sunday. Right. Uh, different ways that we do that, flowers that we do that, phone call. Uh, but for some of you, uh, maybe it's a matter of just being able to remember because mom isn't around anymore, obviously. Right. But that quiet time, right, where you think to yourself and you appreciate what mom has done for you or whoever that mother-type woman in your life, uh, what she has done for you. Well, certainly it's good for us to highlight great things that moms do, but we also recognize the need to continue to pray for Christian mothers, um, to urge them and encourage them uh, as they strive to raise the children that God has given to them. Mothers have that special way of dreaming about what they want their children to become. They have their spiritual hopes and dreams, uh, those goals. Uh, that, that's how they want their children to turn out, right? That's how they want their lives to play out. And they may not have the specific details, obviously, but there are some normal things that a mother wants, right? That their kids have good manners, uh, that they're respectful. And uh, it's always good when the girls come home from a play date or a sleepover. Well, we did this and I did that. And it was like completely opposite, right, of what was at home. Uh, but at least they're respectful and good manners at, home, at someone else's house. Uh, but the healthy hygiene, the healthy habits that we want for our kids, uh, that they learn how to productive, uh, be productive in society, have relationships that are meaningful and, and enjoyable, um, and finally, as a Christian mother, right, uh, that goal of a, of a well-balanced, well-built, solid spiritual foundation. Because a Christian mother recognizes by the promises of God's word that that's going to last into eternity. That there's going to be that reunion with children and grandchildren and grandchildren as that foundation is built and passed on. Well, those are a lot of expectations, and that's just kind of what a mother hopes for with her children. But that then means there's a lot of time and energy exerted. 
That means uh, there can be a lot of heartache at times because sometimes a mother needs to be firm and sometimes there's that chastisement and, and those punishments that need to take place. Uh, moms get stressed out. There's anxiety, uh, aching bones as they're working all day long uh, to keep the family going in the right direction. How important then that Easter joy right, for a Christian mother that sort of continues to flow out of the empty tomb. The joy of Jesus that guides and drives and directs her heart. Uh, thinking of her Savior and the extent of his determination and willingness to serve her. Uh, that fuels the tired arms. Uh, that helps keep her, her sort of stretched schedule in perspective. This is why I'm doing it. Our resurrected Savior uh, has, uh, has a way of sort of confirming that Easter joy and sort of fueling all of our desire to serve as his people. We look back to that last verse of the gospel lesson, verse 12, and this is what Jesus promises. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. And we could spend all day talking about what Jesus had been doing and maybe summarizing He's been loving people. He's been caring for people, even people who don't like him. But then he goes on to say, he will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. While we celebrate the great things moms do for their children, it's hard for us to imagine, uh, all any of us, how we could do things that are greater than what Jesus has been doing. Think of your favorite miracles or, or, or maybe the ones that were the coolest, right? That really grabbed your attention. Hands down, what was the, the most amazing thing Jesus did in his ministry? And maybe it's more than miracles. Maybe it was the way that he cared for certain people or a group of people. Uh, maybe it was Jesus' ability to stay so focused on the task at hand. He was always thinking of his father's plan. Then there was all the times Jesus made promises and he always kept them. Uh, right? Uh, not kind of what we're like. There's a way Jesus spoke. He spoke with authority, the scriptures told us. When he spoke, people listened. And they couldn't explain it, but they just had to hear more of what Jesus had to say. And then finally, one of those things that really grabs our attention is obviously his sacrifice. Willing to die in such a cruel way for people like you and me. Right? We can do things that are greater than that. Well, the key is to go back to the last phrase of that verse where Jesus explains, because I am going to the Father. Throughout his ministry, three years, he spent time with the disciples, training them and teaching them, preparing them for their ministry, uh, equipping them, getting them ready for what's going to happen. All that in mind, uh, he was thinking about his death, his resurrection, he always kept them in mind as he struggled through things from a human standpoint. You know, I need to save the disciples. I need to, to rescue those people. Uh, but he also knew that that plan uh, required that he would go back to heaven. And he knew, uh, being with the disciples and knowing their human nature, uh, they were going to struggle not being able to see him with their own eyes or go to him uh, and have a sit-down talk about what to do with this situation or that situation. As we go back through scriptures, though, every time Jesus talked about uh, his death and his resurrection and him, him leaving, he always followed that up with the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right? I'll send the Holy Spirit to help you, to equip you, to encourage you when you have your bad days. And he did that because he understood their apprehension at times. He could always sense the tension in the air when he talked about certain things. He got their frustration and their confusion, thinking that he was just leaving, uh, hanging them out to dry as he would just leave them. And on the other hand, the disciples, they recognized how powerful Jesus is. It wasn't too hard for them to see that. They saw how popular he was. Everyone wanted to be around Jesus. And as much as they kind of struggled to get along with each other, and all the times that Jesus had to scold them and correct them, they, they realized, Jesus, we need you here. There's no way we're going to get this done. And I bet uh, that you often feel the same way as the disciples did. A day doesn't go by, right, 
when there are those doubts of where life is taking you. Or, or those fears, especially as a, as a mother, man, have I done a good enough job? Uh, what's going to happen when they get older and they're on their own? Or, man, we should have done that when we were in the home. Right? Um, there's the worries. What are my kids going to have to go through in life? And we all talk about that a lot of, man, if we had a bad, I, can't, I don't want to see perhaps what life's going to be for my grandchildren. But, but there's worries, there's fears, and, and that causes us to be worn out, overwhelmed physically uh, as we think about all that God would have us do and how hard it is to do that living in a sinful world, living with our own sinful natures. Well, Jesus reminded the disciples kind of right after our text for the day um, that their relationship with Jesus had changed over the course of three years. And, and he kind of wondered, the disciples probably didn't even realize it. But, but Jesus said this to them, uh, right before he died on the cross that week. He says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. He's commanding them, as we just sang from the, from the gospel lesson, put your fears aside and be certain that I'm going to take care of things. And he's informing them exactly how that's going to happen, that they are going to survive, and actually they're going to succeed, perhaps beyond their own imagination. And that was going to happen, Jesus says, when the counselor comes. I will leave, but the counselor will come, and he'll teach you all things. Then they would do great things, great miracles. So much so that people would flock to them. Some people even started to worship the disciples, the apostles, because of these amazing things that they were able to do. But those great things opened the door for greater things. Although opposition from the Jewish leaders in grew and persecution from the Roman government increased, the people couldn't get enough of the peace and the hope that the apostles brought to them. Put aside that they were healed from their disease or that they could walk again, what grabbed their attention, what they couldn't get enough of was forgiveness, even though they had done some terrible things in their lives, and, and the assurance that when they died, they had a lot to look forward to, an amazing gift of heaven. And, and that's the same great thing, that things that Jesus promises you and I get to do out of love for him. As we respond to the Easter joy, as we still bask in the, the Easter celebration, we also get to do greater things in that we get to tell people about Jesus. And we know sometimes that begins with a kind gesture. Uh, maybe next leads to an invitation to dinner at your house. But eventually, Lord willing, it's the opportunity to say, I forgive you. And more importantly, Jesus forgives you. And, and you don't have to be afraid of cancer uh, because Jesus has taken care of that too. He's going to take you to heaven. That's the greater things that the disciples got to do, uh, enjoying that celebration of Easter. Through faith in Christ, there was this joy, this excitement, plenty of opportunities for them to share the, the hope and the peace that come from the Savior. And that's what we do as fellow disciples, apostles, people who are sent out by Christ to share the gospel message. It's hard work. And, and we want to live as children of God, but we wrestle and, and we know how difficult that can be sometimes. And like the disciples, maybe we feel like we're all alone at times, or, or maybe we feel like we're really not accomplishing much. But here's a promise from Jesus. I tell you the truth, those who have faith in Jesus will get to do great things. Great things for your friends who are struggling in their marriage. Great things for your friend at school who feels the peer pressure and is being bullied. Great things we get to do for people who are weighed down by so much guilt and shame they can barely stand. We have the opportunity to take their sights off of their present sufferings, which Paul says don't even compare to the glory that will be revealed in them. 
Now that Christ has risen, we have opportunities to help people see beyond, right? They're still going to trudge through life, and it's not going to be easy. But we all understand and appreciate the ability to see beyond and know it's worth fighting through all this stuff. And, and along the way, there is Jesus with us. We can't see him, but there he is in his word. Right? Those are the greater things that Jesus talked about. That's the joy of a Christian mother, right? Uh, with her hopes and her spiritual dreams for her children, the power of God's word, those promises that he will preserve and protect their children into eternity. They're great things we all get to do. Maybe what we consider the Easter leftovers. We're, we're still enjoying those morsels, those things we get to do for Jesus. And the amazing thing about these things we do out of love for each other, these acts of kindness, they have a 100% guarantee right, uh, that there will be that blessed reunion in heaven. So we are thankful uh, for the blessings of motherhood and Christian motherhood and, and to be specific. Uh, we pray for Christian mothers. Uh, we pray for mothers in general that uh, they care for their children and, and continue to do so. But we recognize as Christians in general uh, to live as God's people, uh, you know, we need strength. We need help. And maybe as we close on today, we can cherish uh, these words from the prophet Nehemiah. Uh, God's people had come back from 70 years of slavery to a city, Jerusalem, that had all but been destroyed, and they were rebuilding the temple and the walls around the city, and they got discouraged, as you can, under can imagine. Um, Nehemiah has these amazing words for them, and a good reminder for you and I, as we think of all these great things we get to do and how hard they can be at times, uh, Nehemiah says this, the joy of the Lord will always be your strength. Right? The joy of the Lord, the joy that comes from knowing Jesus, the joy that God puts in our hearts because we are his people, we belong to him, that joy will always be your strength. God's richest blessings <clears throat> as you celebrate uh, the amazing things, the great things you get to do to serve your Savior and to serve each other with that Christ-like love. God grant you that in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. The peace of God which surpasses our human understanding will keep and guard your hearts through faith in Jesus. Amen.